Hello everybody, and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. Anybody interested in the history of the Sphinx knows that the Sphinx Temple is the highly weathered building in front of the Paws. But in a recent video, I explained how there was a second Sphinx Temple between the Paws of the Sphinx, which the Dream Stealer was part of, together with two stele of Ramesses II, red painted lions, and an altar for burnt offerings. What many don't know is that there was also a third Sphinx temple to the north of the Great Monument, and built by 18th dynasty king Amenhotep II, father of Tutmos IV, who was the man that cleared away the sands from around the Sphinx, possibly when his father was still king, and then erected the Dream Stealer. This temple was discovered in 1936, and is very important in the history of the Sphinx, because it shows just how important it was in the 18th dynasty, which really is the dynasty of change, and the rise of the cult of the Sphinx, aka the god Horamachet. I claimed in a previous video, that the birth of monotheistic Artanism began with Tutmos IV and his connection with the Sphinx, which I explained was a representation of the one true god worshipped by Akhenaten. Well, thanks to one find in the Sphinx Temple of Amenhotep II, we now actually know that Artanism has its origins with Amenhotep II. Although pictures are few and far between, in the temple there is a great stela of Amenhotep II, that was housed in a small hall at the rear of the main hall of the temple. But set against the northern wall of the temple is a smaller stela, also bearing the name of the king. On this stela we find a representation of a winged solar disc, which has human arms and hands supporting a large cartouche of Amenhotep II's father, Tutmos III. To Akhenaten, who was Amenhotep II's great-grandson, the solar disc with arms and hands was a visible representation of what I called the Holy Spirit, whilst the Sphinx is a representation of the father god Horamachet, whilst the sun is the pharaoh. Artanism was the birth of the Holy Trinity and monotheistic worship, and now, thanks to the find at the temple, we can say that it has its origins with Amenhotep II. Although the stela has the art and sun disc holding the cartouche of Tutmos III, the stela is the work of Amenhotep II. Therefore it is possible that Artanism goes back even further to Tutmos III, but evidence is circumstantial at best. Before Akhenaten made Artanism the state religion, I believe that the 18th dynasty kings of Egypt secretly practiced the monotheistic religion that I call the Cult of the Sphinx, something that clearly continued after Akhenaten's reign due to the finds of Seti I and Ramesses II at this location. At the Third Sphinx Temple, many votive figures of lions and sphinxes were uncovered, as shown here, the lion being particularly sacred to the Cult of the Sphinx. These figures were made of various materials, such as bronze, faience and limestone, and lions of all shapes and sizes were excavated. It was clear that as well as being used for offerings, they also decorated the Sphinx Temple, just as they decorated the Temple Between the Paws. There were also plaques and statues of hawks, another way to represent the god Horamachet or Horakti. There were also statues of the Queen, steely created by princes, an offering table and three doorways. One doorway perfectly framed the front of the Sphinx, and another framed the Great Pyramid. There were also doorposts and stele created by the next king, Tutmos IV, which, like the Dream Stealer, also has him giving offerings to the Sphinx, aka Horamachet. There were also a number of chapels in the temple, and one was dedicated to the later pharaoh, Seti I, which shows the pharaoh hunting big game in the desert. In this temple was also found a small copper votive sphinx. Copper lions, sphinxes and hawks, as well as a number of sphinx stele, were very common throughout the temple and clearly originated from various dates throughout history. In fact, there were finds that dated all the way up to the Roman era. The name of the sphinx, Horamachet, was inscribed everywhere, and this, together with the amount of recumbent lion statues, makes it clear that the 18th dynasty Egyptians believed the sphinx was a lion and was a representation of the god Horamachet. This cannot really be argued as far as I can see. But Egypt wasn't monotheist just yet, and although the main focus was Horamachet, we also find depictions of Osiris, Isis and Ptah in the temple, but they were certainly not as prominent as the Sphinx god Horamachet. 
The number of finds at this temple proves the popularity of the Sphinx as a place of pilgrimage, and kings and commoners alike left a lasting memento of their visit to the holy site. Some of the idols, artefacts and stele found are real works of art, others are more amateurish but they all show the importance of the Sphinx monument. There are a particular series of small stele that are arguably the most bizarre, and for obvious reasons they are known as the ear tablets, due to the fact that they feature representations of human ears. It was once thought that they were dedicated by deaf people in the hope of obtaining a cure for their affliction. Others said that by adding ears to a tablet meant that the god could better hear the prayers of the worshipper, therefore having ears on a tablet would draw the attention of the god. On some tablets there are dozens of ears, and compared to other types of Egyptian iconography, I must say it looks totally bizarre. Professor Selim Hassan believed that sculpted ears were substitutes for the ears of the god. The devotee would make a pilgrimage to a sacred spot, dedicate an ear tablet or ear sculpture to the god of a specific sanctuary, and then make his petition or prayer orally into the ear, which was then set up against the wall of the temple or buried in the sand surrounding it. The ear would then retain the prayer of the devotee, and his petition would receive the attention of the god. As Hassan puts it, it was filed for reference. As well as around the Sphinx and inside the temple of Amenhotep II, ear tablets have also been found at Memphis, in the surroundings of the Temple of Ptah. Other ear tablets were devoted to Amun, Isis and Thoth. They were therefore a common symbol in ancient Egyptian worship. Some modern Egyptologists liken them to a form of mobile phone, an ancient direct line to the specific god being worshipped. Each ear tablet bears the words made by, followed by the name of the donor, and this seems to be referring to the prayer made into the ear and not the tablet itself. So the prayer is made by so and so, but the tablet is not necessarily made by the same person. Some historians once believed that a tablet with a huge number of ears was a dedication to an obscure god with just as many ears, but this idea has since been played down. It is more likely that for each ear depicted there was a specific prayer or petition. It could have also been a safety first mechanism, so that if one or more ears had gotten damaged there were still more ears to listen. As I showed in a previous video, the Egyptians believed that if imagery on a tablet got damaged it would no longer function. In the vicinity of the Great Sphinx, which represented the great god Horomachet, we do find a number of ear tablets. This example is made of limestone and shows two ears of the god carved in low relief, and between them is the god Horomachet in the form of a hawk. At the bottom a horizontal inscription says made by Hui. This specimen shows one large ear in high relief and beside it is a small figure of the god Horakti in the form of a hawk, perched upon a high pedestal and it is made by May. Here we see another single ear in high relief, and beneath it are two hawks wearing a double crown and standing beak to beak as though whispering together. Selim Hassan wonders if the hawks are repeating the prayer of the devotee into the ear of the god. In this example, the stealer has a whopping 31 ears, and like the dream stealer and the stele of Ramesses II, we see the donor before the sphinx. Above the Sphinx it says, Horomachet the great god hears. It also says, made by the clever scribe Mer. Here we see the Sphinx again, with two ears underneath, clearly the work of an unskilled amateur, but interesting nonetheless. Although the ear tablets don't add a great deal to the bigger picture of the mystery of the Giza Plateau, I do think they are an interesting curiosity of ancient Egypt. The Sphinx Temple of Amenhotep II shows just how prevalent the cult of the Sphinx, aka Horomachet, was in the 18th dynasty, and we can see how Amenhotep II paved the way for his great grandson Akhenaten with the first depiction of the Aten, aka the solar disc with arms and hands. We see a great deal of evidence for the identity of the Sphinx as the lion bodied great god Horomachet, aka Herakti, as I discussed at length in a previous video, linked below and at the end of this video. But we also see evidence of Amenhotep II's successor, Tutmos IV, scrubbing out the names of the other princes in the temple, probably to cement his own kingship, which may not have been an easy ascension, as we know that he was not the true heir to the throne. The temple shows clearly that Tutmos IV simply continued the work of his father at the Sphinx, and the story on the Dream Stealer that indicates that the Sphinx chose him to be king is clearly propaganda and, in my opinion, a somewhat desperate way to claim kingship. 
In the 18th dynasty, Horamakhet represented the Great Sphinx at Giza, was the prime Egyptian deity, and the temple of Amenhotep II confirms this. The name Horamakhet is given only to the Sphinx of Giza, and the first written record of this god is by Prince Armenmes, the son of the third 18th dynasty king, Tutmose I, on an inscription found close to the Sphinx, which says, Year 4 under the majesty of Tutmose I, beloved of Horamakhet, given life like Ra forever. Although the rise in Artanism seems to begin in the reign of Amenhotep II, the rise in the cult of the Sphinx and the true origins of Artanism seem to have begun four kings earlier, by Tutmose I, and a little known structure close to the Sphinx may confirm this, something I will discuss further in a future video. I have just launched a new YouTube channel called Space and Planets, which looks at Earth and space science news, as well as independent scientific research from around the world. Please subscribe now to give my new channel a head start, I have placed a link in the description below. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.